Oh, my first day in court, I wish to Well, welcome back to Barley and Hops. Yes, this is the channel that dares to unlock all those mysteries of home distilling. Now, our intent is to make you as safe and also successful as possible uh, through your endeavors. Now, it doesn't really matter uh, what your process is. Whether you're making beer, making wine, a lot of these processes are carryovers into all of those different hobbies. Now, that includes Bakelite ovens in this particular video, um, kilns, uh, anywhere where you are using heat and you need precise control. Now, uh, when we talk about precise control, of course, there are many, many different ways of doing this. One of them is SCRs, silicone controlled rectifiers. And the other ones are triac, now, and they're both kind of like the same thing when you, when you really fully understand them. But it, what that does is that allows you to control the amount of voltage uh, that travels through a circuit, and thereby you can control the heat source. Okay? And, but, but those are variably, variably controlled, which makes them a variable heat controller. They work. They're wonderful. Um, the only thing is, is that you've got to control it. Uh, so, uh, again, you've got a manual input uh, that you've got to mess with, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there is also PID controls, and those are the ones that I am more familiar with. Well, not more familiar with, but more favorable to because they are nothing more than really SCRs or triacs on steroids because they are proportional integral derivative, and they control precisely the temperature on their own without any other input but a temperature selection made by you. Now, uh, there are folks out there who have tried uh, in the past, unsuccessfully I might add, um, using like a household dimmer switch. Remember that with the amperage that you're going to draw with a heater element will far, far exceed any dimmer switch or small potentiometer. If you find a potentiometer on the internet, that will handle the, the amount of amperage that you're going to try to push through that, you're going to pay an arm and a leg for it, okay? Take my word for it. They are not cheap. Now, let's get on to this because we're talking about heater elements. And, you know, heater elements come in many, many different varieties and shapes and forms. These are made by Richmond. I bought three of them today. I bought a 3,000 watt and I bought two 4,500 uh, 4, watt elements. All three of those are in uh, 240 volt uh, elements. And the reason I bought 240 volt elements is for my purpose. Okay, I'm going to use them. But I thought it'd be a good time to explain these briefly. All right. Um, this is a 4,500 watt, 240 volt element, uh, and it's a high density element. What's the difference between a high density and a low density? Well, let me show you a medium density. You notice the amount of metal on this one? Yeah. There's a lot more metal because it's a medium density. A low density would have even more metal. Okay? And this is a high density. So the only difference between these two are the density of the material. Okay? Therefore, in a low density or medium density, you'll have more surface area in contact, but you get the same heat. And it's the same thing with a high density you're going to get the same heat because they are both rated at 4,500 watts. All right? And this one is rated at 3,000 watts. And we're going to get to that. Now, what, what's interesting to note about heater elements, all heater elements are standard, all right? And they come with a 1-inch NPT. And I paid, I did not pay more than $7 for any one of these. One of them was five ninety-eight, I believe. So they're very inexpensive, uh, they're easy to replace, and they last a long, long time. They come with a 1-inch NPT threaded uh, base. And all you need in your still, your Bakelite oven, or your kiln, or however you have your heating elements arrayed, uh, is a means, a way to get that in there. So you just need a 1-inch NPT coupling uh, on the side of the still to screw this into. And this comes with a gasket so that when you screw it on there, all you do is turn it one quarter to one half turn additional to seat that so it doesn't leak. For those of you who want to go and be, uh, go above and beyond the call of duty, yes, if you want to put Teflon tape around there, that's perfectly okay. All right. 
all elements also, you'll notice on the bottom, have only two screws. You'll see there's one there, and then there's one there. They are not polarity specific, which means that it doesn't matter which wire you put on there, uh, the screws don't care. You've got, for 120 volts, you'll have a hot wire going in, and you'll have a neutral wire on the other side. And if you understand the flow of electricity, alternating current, which means it's high, low, high, low, high, low, so it's going in both directions, uh, it makes no difference. Now, if this was a, and this is a 240 volt element, so it requires one hot wire and one hot wire. And so therefore you have 120 volts high at the same time that you have 120 volts low. And when you have electricity provided in that manner, it is much more efficient. It takes half the amperage, but you've got twice the voltage. Add them together, you get 240 volts. Now, some of you may refer to that as 220, and that's quite all right. Just like you'll refer to 120 volts as 110 or 115. And why is that difference? It's called RMS, root mean square. It, don't worry about that. It's just sort of like common terms, which, which you hear over and over and over again is what you refer to. So that's it about heater elements at this point. But what, what, I, what I need to explain to you is the following. Now, there are times when someone may want to use a larger element on less voltage. It, it's kind of what we already do if we're using a variable controller or we're using a PID controller of some sort some method to control the voltage because it's the voltage that goes through the element at a current, a, a fixed current uh, that allows it to heat up and produce the heat. That's where your, that's your energy. Okay? So if we start off with a 240 volt element and um, let's say for instance this one is 4500 watts. Well, the easiest way to figure out what the amperage requirement is for that is to divide 240 volts into the 4,500. And you know what that is? That's 18.75 amps. So that's what it will draw at 100%. But, of course, we're not always operating at 100%. Um, it, whether it be the variable controller or be the PID controller, it's going to be somewhere between 0 and 100 all right, now, and we're going to get to that, okay? Um, let's say, for instance, you had a 5,500-watt element, and you were on 240 volts. Well, the amperage draw for that, really, it, it's, it's, not, it's simply 5,500 divided by 240, which is 22.91 amps, all right? So that's how we figure that out. And what this tells us right here, what this figure here tells us and what this figure here is going to tell us is going to tell us what type of circuit we're required to have. In this first case, you know, a 20 amp circuit, oh, there you go, yeah. A 20 amp circuit would be sufficient. We'd be getting close, but it would be sufficient. But in this particular case, we would blow that 20 amp circuit and it would be unsafe. So far, so good. Let's say, for instance, we have a 5,500 watt element, all right, and we're going to operate that on 240 volts, because that's pretty much standard, okay? A 5,500 watt is going to come as a 240 volt element. Um, you're only going to get the largest 120 volt element that you're going to get is going to be in a 2,000 watt, okay? That's the largest one that they make, and the reason for that is, is that because this one draws 16.6 .6 amps. All right. Now, how do we know that? We know that because we just take 2,000 divided by 120. That's the formula to figure out how many amps it draws at 100%. So what is it for a 5,500-watt element? If we divide that by 240, our result is 22.91 amps. So we need a circuit large enough that will handle 22.91 amps. Really, we want to go above that. Okay? Because we want to have some, we want to have some fluctuation in playroom. If you work on the verge, on the edge of, in, mo in most cases, an electrician will normally tell you 125% of your rate. 
So we would, we, we would more than likely place one 5,500 watt element on a 30 amp circuit, just in order to be safe, okay? Good. See, say we're getting somewhere. Now, if you've got a 20, 240 volt element and you operate that on 120 volts, what happens? Well, yeah. Be, now, remember we talked about this with the, if you're using an, an SCR or a variable controller or a pulse width modulator or a PID, whatever you're using is going to control the voltage that's going to the element. So if you're using less voltage, of course, you're going to have less heat. So what that will do is that will reduce the output and the potential in total wattage. Hmm. They, here's, believe it or not, this is how simple this is. This is the formula. 240 divided by 120 squared. And if you do the math, 240 divided by 120 is going to be 0.5. Square that times 0.5 equals 0.25. Oh, so in that case, a 5,500 watt element operating on 120 volts will not be half of 5,500. It will be 25% of that. And what is 25% of 5,500? 5,500 times 0.25 equals, had to grab the calculator, 5,500 times 0.25 equals a total of 1,375 watts. So you see, you've changed, you've changed the element itself. All right? So don't think that you can go with a larger element and just run less voltage through it and you get half of it. No, it actually works out to be 25% of that. Now, warning, if you've got a 120 volt element, a hundred, yeah, there you go. If you've got a 120 volt element and you operate that on 240 volts, what do you think happens? Yes. It's going to break. All right, you can't do that. But you can go the opposite direction, all right? Gosh, it makes sense now. Now, what, what happens in ovens in most cases is you'll have multiple. You'll have either four, six, eight. You'll have a bunch of elements. It all depends, again, on the size of the oven and what you're using the oven for. Now, in this particular case, if you hook them in parallel, all right. Of course, the resistance goes down, which means your amperage goes up. So you've got to be able to add all of your elements together and know what the wattage is, the overall wattage of your oven is, so that you can match that appropriately to your circuit. Hmm. Too, too easy. Um, all too often, what will happen is, is we will always go lower for some reason. In our minds, we try to rationalize that, oh gosh, this, this ought to just do it. Uh, do a little bit of research, uh, check out online. There's plenty of YouTube videos out there that will explain it in greater detail than I have. But always err on the side of safety. And if you can, go up to the next higher um, the safety margin. As an example, in a solid state relay, and we're going to use, and I use these for PIDs on a regular basis, and normally they come as 25DA. And what 25DA means is that it's rated at 25 amps. It uses direct current in to control this small light here that comes on to control the amperage across these two pins, which act as a switch. So it's Direct current in, alternating current controlled. Uh, I normally put in all PIDs, um, all the way up to, unless I'm doing a multiple element PID controller, I'll always put in a 40 amp. And that is more of a safety margin for you on your end as it is for anything else. Uh, a 25 amp element, a 25 DA will do, will do great wonders for a 2,000 watt element. Because remember, a 2,000 watt element only draws 16.6 .6 amps. And we've got 25 amps 
of safety margin. But I'll always put a 40 in because it's just, it's better to have and not need than to need and not have. You follow me? Failure to do so will cause this thing to heat up uh, and melt and, again, fail. So that's the result of that. Well, hopefully we've covered everything you really need to know about heater elements, high density, low density, medium density, wiring these things, because there's only two screws on here. And, uh, oh, by the way, yes, what happens to the ground? Where does the ground go? Because there's ground in all of your cable. Yes, the ground is known as an appliance ground, okay? You can either connect that to the outside of the element here on the nut, which is difficult to do, or do like... Most appliances, they have an appliance ground, which is anywhere on your system, on your metal, on your kettle, on your oven, on your kiln. That's where your appliance ground goes. So, I hope we've covered all of that, and until next time, yes, happy distilling.